Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone to please silence their cell phones. The Sunken Gold tells the story of the Laurentic, a British ship laden with 44 tons of Allied gold that sank off the coast of Ireland. Joseph Williams is an author, librarian, activist, and historian. He worked for the State University of New York Maritime College's Stephen B. Luce Library, which specializes in nautical research. He is currently the Deputy Director of Greenwich Library. He has been published in the fields of maritime history and librarianship. Please give him a warm welcome. Shall we dive right in? There's going to be plenty of puns tonight. So <clears throat> this is the sunken gold. A story of World War I, espionage, and the greatest treasure salvage in history. There's been no salvage that's been greater than this one. But I guess I'll let you guys be the judge of that. So we're going to just get right into it. This here is HMS Laurentic. It's a transatlantic liner of the White Star Line. So if you don't know what the White Star Line was, it's a shipping line that uh, brought us ships as the Titanic and such. Uh, it, at the beginning of the First World War, it was converted into a patrol ship by the Royal Navy. And it patrolled all over the world. Uh, and then it was assigned to the run from Liverpool, England, to Halifax, Nova Scotia. And it was given various cargoes, troop transports, and the like to move back and forth. On January 26, 1917, a secret consignment of boxes were loaded into the holds of the Laurentic. Each one of those boxes was simply labeled metal. None of the crew knew what was in those boxes with the exception of the captain and a few of those officers. But I'm going to tell you what's in those boxes. Gold. 44 tons of the stuff. So when the title of this book, it's called The Sunken Gold, it's not an allegory for anything. It really, I'm really talking about gold. What was the gold for? The gold was, uh, at this point in the war, it's 1917. The United States had not yet joined the conflict, and the credit and economies of the Allies were collapsing. So... Great Britain had taken on uh, the economic uh, backing of its allies, particularly France and Russia, whose economies had collapsed. And as part of doing so, it would send these shipments of gold uh, bullion all over the world. So to, it was, some would go to its colonies, others would go, direct, go over to the United States, either to uh, act as collateral for credit or sometimes to directly buy munitions. In the case of the Laurentic, the 44 tons of gold aboard it were meant to buy munitions for the Western Front. The, um, the 44 tons of gold, by the way, in cal I did a calculation on this. Uh, the value today of that much treasure is $1.7 billion. So it was a significant sum at the time and a fairly monumental hoard. However, there were some problems. Uh, going on in early 1917. The German Empire was escalating its U-boat campaign against Allied shipping. So the Germans, their fleet, their surface fleet, had been by this point in the war bottled up into its ports in the Baltic. And it was forced increasingly to rely on using submarines uh, in order to uh, fight the war. The Germans early on in the war had, in fact, uh, loose submarines very effectively against Allied shipping, but because of objections by the United States, in particular after the sinking of the Lusitania, it restricted uh, the use of the uh, the use of the U-boat. However, by 1917, uh, Germany uh, is now starting to get a little bit desperate, and it decides it's going to use its submarines full scale again in an unrestricted campaign. Uh, as a result of this, the Germans knew that this would uh, bring the United States eventually into the war, which it does, uh, but they're hoping that they can serve a knockout blow, particularly to Great Britain, 
so that they can receive favorable terms for a piece. So what you see here on the left is a German UB type boat. Uh, you can see by looking at here how small this craft was. This was a torpedo craft. Uh, they would typically sink ships using deck guns. Most of the time torpedoes were far too expensive or by loading or in using mines like the one that you see on the left. I always find it a little bit interesting as to how these naval mines worked because they didn't just uh, float at the surface. They were tethered into mid-water. The way that they would work is that the, um, the German crew would dump one of these mines over the side and it would go down to the bottom where these brackets would anchor into the seafloor. At the base of the mine, there was a water-soluble plug that after a while it would give way and the mine would float up and hang on the tether. The horns then would be uh, the thing that a vessel would strike into and breaking it, it would release a chemical into the mine uh, resulting in an explosion and destroying the vessel. So the Laurentic was leaving Liverpool bound for Halifax with gold that was eventually going to go to the United States. And it first had to stop in Northern Ireland. So it does the stop in Northern Ireland, offloads its crew, and then proceeds out of the mouth of Loch Swilly, which is a coastal fjord uh, in the north of Ireland. It's a beautiful, very, very dramatic looking place. When it strikes two German mines on its starboard side and then sinks into the sea. So one part of this book is about the travails of the, of the Laurentic, about how, it's, how it left Liverpool, its course up to the north of Ireland, and how uh, after striking the mines and it's sinking about how most of the crew, and there were about 430 souls aboard the Laurentic, safely evacuated into the lifeboats. However, it is January 26th and a winter gale comes in. At this time, lifeboats were open affairs. They're open affairs. So typically, like nowadays, a lifeboat tends to be enclosed. These are open boats. The men get on board the lifeboats. A winter gale comes in. Temperatures drop. Most of the men on the lifeboats uh, who were ill-clad, because a lot of them came up from the engine room where they were lightly clad, uh, freeze to death by the morning. So that you only have, uh, out of the crew of 430-something, uh, 117 end up surviving. Uh, the Laurentic, so uh, su surviving the sinking. So the Laurentic goes down, uh, and with it, it's uh, boxes of gold. And when word when word of this gets back to the Admiralty, we're, uh, it's passed along to the government, and everybody kind of goes bananas because it's a significant sum of money. They need it for the war effort, and they want to be able to get that gold back. So the first thing that the government does is they contact private salvage firms and they ask them if it's possible for them to send divers to go recover the treasure. So some of the private salvage firms say, uh, no, it's not feasible. And then others say, well, yeah, we could do it or we'll give it a try, but we want to have 50% of the gold in recompense. So this was unacceptable to the uh, government who needed it for war purposes. So they ended up turning to this man here. His name is Lieutenant Commander Gibbon Chesney Castel de Mant. He is a blue blood from the Isle of Wight. He, is, uh, he was a gunnery officer. He was an amateur physiologist. And he was one of the few officers in the Royal Navy who was an expert at diving. You see, diving in the early 20th century, both, both in the United States and in Great Britain, were considered to be very uh, crude occupations reserved for the enlisted because of what divers did. Divers would go over the side, they would clear barnacles off of ships, they would unfoul anchors, or they might say, look around in the muck for the admiral's lost ring that fell over the side, stuff like that. Right. But, to, but by a quirk of the service, gunnery officers in the Royal Navy 
were in charge of the divers. So as part of his training, he was exposed to diving as, just as in, in a general sense so that he knew uh, what they did, and he took dives himself. And when he took dives, he fell in love with it immediately. He thought it was a wonderful experience, and he immediately started volunteering to do more and more diving and more and more work. And he eventually came under the tutelage of um, Professor John Scott Haldane. He was a professor from Oxford who, um, who really trained him in the ways of diving and of working with compressed air. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But what DeMant learned was the real physical outfit of diving and the dangers involved with it. So I always find it fascinating how these suits work. Because the first thing you got to understand, and what makes this type of diving particularly hazardous, is the physical connection that the divers had with the surface. So imagine this bottle here. Imagine that this is uh, a boat just floating at the top of the water. The divers would be connected to it by two strings that you can see here on the left. That being the lifeline and the air hose, or what the British would call the air pipe and the breast rope. So these are coming off of the top, right? And because of this physical connection, any time the surface vessel would rock or roll or pitch, it would pull at those lines. So a diver working at the bottom, working at depth, would always be prone to be yanked suddenly from the surface vessel. So conditions had to be as calm as possible in order to successfully do a task underwater. In order to compensate for this problem, what they would do at the surface is that they would pay out more line. Right? So this would create, this would compensate for the divers to give them more slack on the line so that they would be able to wander around and do more and more work. But that in and of itself was a problem because the extra line had a tendency to wrap around things, wrap around wreckage, wrap around, um, wrap around other divers' lines for that matter, uh, what they would call fouling. And any time, like for example, if, something, if uh, a diver's lines uh, fell into the wreckage, there was always a threat that it was going to get cut or something to that effect. Then the next thing you'll notice about this dress is that uh, the helmet, right? So the helmet, that is where the compressed air was delivered through these connections. And the compressed air would then fill into the rest of the uh, diving rig here. So it was, essentially, it was essentially a dry type of suit. It would be air inside. Um, <clears throat> And inside the helmet itself were all sorts of buttons and levers that they would have to knock about with their head uh, in order to, uh, in order to like, control taps, things like that. There was actually even a, a transmitter on the inside of the helmet that allowed them to telephone up to the surface via a, via a copper wire that ran up through the lifeline itself. So there was actually like communication, direct communication, between uh, those on the bottom and those on the surface. Now, because the air is coming in through the top and the air is coming down below, the diver had to stay as upright as possible at all times. And that is why you have weights that are rigged onto the diver, fore and aft, and then at the feet. So you see the leaded boots. You see uh, these chest weights in the American gear. They actually had a belt with weights inside of it and the like. And that was to make sure that the diver did not upend. The most dangerous position for any of these divers was to suddenly turn and flip upside down. So if they flipped upside down, and if there was any cut or any part of the dress was compromised here, the water would immediately rush down to the helmet, and it would only take a quart or two of water to drown a man. So altogether, the weight that they bore was usually between 150 to 200 pounds on the surface. But when they got into the water, the compressed air that pumped into the suit made them buoyant so that they were able to successfully do work. But keep in mind as we talk about these divers that they're not scuba divers. They're not moving around freely through the water. They're tethered and they're walking around. 
Another problem was actually the delivery of air itself. So what you see here is a traditional type of air pump. They had motorized compressed air pumps at the time, but uh, they weren't as reliable as using these hand crank uh, pumps. And you can see that you have gangs of sailors who would turn the cranks on the pump. And as the diver had to go deeper and deeper still, you had to turn those cranks faster and faster to build up the compression of the air. So diving on the bottom uh, was, uh, was or getting really deep was a challenging thing. Then you had other associated problems. The first thing is uh, this, what we call the blow up. So it looks kind of funny, right? Except if, you're, except if you're the guy in the suit. The blow up occurs because air comes into the suit and as somebody, and the air has to come out of the suit. If there's a blockage of any kind, there could be a tendency for the suit to suddenly fill up with compressed air. And if there's no escape for it, it can overinflate, causing this uh, position here called the blow-up. What happens with the blow-up is that the arms go akimbo and the legs go akimbo like this. So when you're in this position, the diver cannot reach the connections for the air and they have no control over the air. Excuse me? Let me just fix that. As a diver blows up, they start flying up into the water higher and higher and higher. The compressed air that's in the suit expands out even more as the water pressure grows less. And then the diving dress can rupture. If the diving dress ruptures, uh, what happens then is the diver, who's wearing all this 150 pounds to 200 pounds of weight, will suddenly then sink back to the bottom and die, drown in his helmet. Or sometimes what they do is they would come up, they would smash into the keel of the diving boat, and then they would go back down to the bottom. This is very, very dangerous. Now the opposite of the blow up was called the squeeze. So these divers, they're walking around on wrecks and things like that. And remember, they're not swimming freely through the water. All of a sudden, they could come, they're, working, they're walking around, and then all of a sudden they take a fall and they drop. So as you drop in the water, what happens is the ambient water pressure around you grows greater very quickly too quickly for them to deliver more compressed air into the dress. As a result, that water pressure then crushes you, squeezes you, breaks your, uh, breaks your bones, cracks your ribs, ruptures organs. So that in itself was very deadly. Then, of course, there was the most insidious danger of them all. So it was called diver's palsy. It was called Caisson's disease, decompression sickness, or most commonly called the bends, called so because of the position that the afflicted often took. Now, uh, most of you are probably familiar with de what decompression sickness is, but uh, for those of you who do not know, I usually like to compare it to a bottle of seltzer water. A diver, when they go down, they're breathing in compressed air, and this gets absorbed into their body. So if you look at a bottle of seltzer water and you touch it w w before you open it, it's nice and firm. And if you look at it, you don't see any bubbles or anything like that. There is air, carbon dioxide, under pressure inside the fluid of the seltzer water. So when you open up the bottle, the pressurized air inside suddenly escapes. And then what happens to that fluid inside? What happens? What forms? Yeah, bubbles. So if a diver comes up incorrectly at the wrong rate or, or, or something like that, what happens is bubbles start to form inside the body, in particular nitrogen bubbles, which aren't easily gotten rid of by the body. And these start traveling around. And as they travel around, they'll lodge into the spine, they'll lodge into joints, they'll go up to the brain, end up all over the place, and they'll cause a whole a panoply of symptoms, blindness, paralysis, death, and the like. So uh, when a diver would show symptoms of the bends, one way that they would treat them is to use this device here. This is a recompression chamber. A diver who would come up and was afflicted would be put into this airtight chamber, and there they would be exposed 
to compressed air. The air compression would then force those bubbles that were in the body to go back into solution and the symptoms would subside and then they can, you know, work, work it out. Now, by this, by this, the other way you could do it is if a diver came up and they suddenly had a case of the bend, you just send them right back to the bottom and you expose them to compressed air again. Now, by the time you're in the early 20th century and demand is receiving all this training on diving, they didn't know how to effectively prevent the bends. They knew exactly what the, what the problem was, but they didn't really know how to solve the problem. So DeMant worked with uh, John Scott Halding, that professor from Oxford, and they developed a method of decompression for divers called stage decompression, uh, which is still used today. So a diver would come up at certain levels. They figured this out, and they would be able to decompress. Uh, like I said, this is still used today. Uh, Demand himself, he set a diving record at 33 fathoms. So a fathom is six feet, so do six times 33, that's whatever that is. But uh, the record, like a couple of, uh, uh, the record that was set a couple of years ago was by an Egyptian, and he dove about 1,200 feet under compressed air. It took him only 45 minutes to get down to that depth, but then it took him 14 hours to decompress because it's a slow process to get up to the surface. So Demant, uh, then, so Demant, by the time he goes through all this training, he's named Inspector of Diving. He's really well known uh, as a diver, as an expert at diving, and the Admiralty, calls him into Whitehall. Now Whitehall is where the Admiralty offices was and he goes to their main council chamber. And he's a lieutenant commander. He, he, goes into, he goes into this room and all about them are these admirals and there's some of the heads of the Royal Navy. They, these, guys, these are the guys called the Sea Lords. So he goes down there and he doesn't know what they want. So they first ask him, and uh, I can't do the British accent, sorry guys. I'm, I was born on Long Island, I just can't do it. <laughs> And he goes, he goes, have you heard of the Laurentic? And a demand knew about the Laurentic. He heard about uh, that it sunk. But they were one of many ships that had sunk at that time. So he didn't really think anything of it. So then one of these admirals, he turns to him and says, well, Lieutenant Commander Demand, you are about to be privy to a secret. Aboard the Laurentic, there was 44 tons of gold that is needed for the war effort. It would be a national tragedy if we do not get that gold back. The private salvage firms, they say they cannot do it, but we want to pose a question to you, Lieutenant Commander Demant. And is it feasible to use Royal Navy divers to get the gold? So Demant thinks about this for a moment, and he says, yes. So the admirals go, We'll go get it. So he, try, he goes to go get the gold. So uh, a, part of a, a part of this book is a, lot of, is a biography of Demant because he's actually very significant in uh, diving history, but a largely unknown character today. And that's part because of his, uh, his aristocrat heritage. He was very unassuming. He didn't really uh, publicize himself that much. Uh, but I was able to obtain a lot of records from the family and such, so um, I don't think actually he would like the fact that I was writing about him in the first place. But anyway, he's, he goes off now to Loch Swilly, and this is just a map that shows you where the Laurentic sank, and it's important to understand that, remember what I said about the need for calm diving conditions? Well, this here, this is the open Atlantic, over here, and a nasty storm would often fetch its way from the south, from Loch Swilly. So more often than not, they're going to be hammered by very awful diving conditions for that day. So they spent some time, there's some time spent trying to locate the wreck of the Laurentic, and they finally find it in uh, February, mid-February mid 1917. And the divers go down and they find the wreck in this condition right here. Uh, it's not sawed off. This is just a, this is just a cross section. Um, oh, excuse me. So what, what they do is the divers come down and they land on the wreck. So they have to do a lot of residual work that's actually pretty dangerous. They're dealing with these lines that are floating off of the Laurentic. These were the lines, what are called falls, 
that are attached to the uh, lifeboats. And these were like flying around and they had to cut all that loose. And then what they did after that was uh, they worked their way down here. Remember, they're like more like doing like cave diving because of the angles of the deck uh, where they find a door. This is the port side, by the way, so like kind of think of it in reverse. Uh, so they find a starboard port door over here by, the, by, a cargo, uh, by a cargo hold, and they try to force it open. They can't do that, so Demant decides he's going to blow the thing up. So he goes down with canisters of gun cotton, and they set off explosive charges to blow open the door. So they get that door loose, and then their first real issue is a cavalcade of debris that comes flying out. Of the, uh, of the cargo holds, things like sacks of flour, barrels, things like that. And this all has to be removed. And it's all a slow process because the divers go down, they come up, go down, they have to decompress. You can only send down maybe two divers at a time on this work. And as they're working inside, you want to send down only one diver at a time because when they're working inside the wreck with that lifeline and the air hose, you don't want to make things too complicated by sending down too many divers at the same time. So over the course of a couple of weeks, they start clearing out the passage. And where they're aiming to get at is right here in the center of the ship. The gold was not stored in the cargo hold. No, it was stored in the second class baggage room, which you can see on this diagram here. So this is right here. It says gold stored here, over here. So they had to worm their way into the ship. And they go ahead and they, you know, they do this after um, several weeks of work. You know, and all the time, the whole time that this is going on, there is an intense anxiety that the Germans are going to attack them at any given moment. The Germans did not know that the gold was in the Laurentic, but the Germans also were highly active at that time. There were minesweepers uh, about all the time setting off mines that were being laid by the Germans. So there was always a chance of that occurring as this work went on. Finally, the divers make their way over toward uh, the second class baggage room. And remember the deck, how it's tilted like this. So the divers are kind of working and sliding around inside the deck. And they get there and they find something un unexpected that they didn't know about. An iron gate had been built over the second class baggage room to protect the gold. So Demand then decides what he's going to do now is, it looks like we're about to get in touch with the gold. I'm going to send down my best guy. And that's that, this guy here on the left. His name is Charles Ernest Miller. He was a ship's carpenter. And uh, he, was, he was probably the best working diver in the Royal Navy at the time. If there was a historic... Uh, historic hall of fame of diving, he would be elected in the first round because of his deeds on the Laurentic and his deeds throughout the war itself. Well, Miller goes down and he gets in the ship and he's worming his way through and he finally gets the iron gate, right? He gets there and he has with him, he has with him his handy uh, cold chisel and a hammer. And, he's, and remember, the, de the deck's tilted, so he's like doing the work like this and he's banging away at it. And he, get, he gets the door free, removes it, and then he goes down in, and then he takes a little slide. He slides down, he falls down, and he lands on all these wooden boxes. And each one of those wooden boxes weighed about 120 pounds each. He had found the gold. So, ecstatic, the first thing he does is he starts, he hooks up a sling uh, to get the first box of gold out of the Laurentic. So this is no easy task, by the way, because when you hook up a sling, you don't have a straight line to haul it up to the surface. So what he had to do was physically lift this box, pulling it along, guiding a line higher and higher until he got to that cargo door. And, uh, and this he manages to do after about an hour and a half worth of work. And he decompresses up to the surface. But because he had been underwater for so long, he's suddenly stricken by the bends. And they uh, put him in the uh, diver's oven, which was their nickname for the recompression chamber. And they, 
they actually were successful at decompressing him, and he's good enough by the morning that Demant, who views Miller as his good luck charm, sends him down again to do it again. So the next day, Miller recovers two more gold boxes. Very tough work. This time he comes up and he's decompressed successfully. And Demant is absolutely thrilled. And he pens off a letter to the Admiralty stating that uh, I anticipate uh, recovering all of the gold within about two to three weeks. And then a storm comes in. So a storm comes in, uh, and it's this gale off of the Atlantic, and it keeps on going, and it's subsequently followed by other storms and just generally awful weather. So demand has to call off the diving. So to pass the time while he's waiting, he takes to walking about the shores of Loch Swilly. And then he begins to notice stuff. He notices that debris is starting to come up onto the shores of the loch. Things like uh, parquet floor tiling, furniture, and the like. Things that were deep inside the Laurentic. So something was going on underneath the water. And when the divers came back, they found this. So this is your before and after. Wind, wind and tide had crushed the Laurentic like an accordion. Not knowing what else to do, Demant decides he's going to try to send the divers back. Remember how they went through a door here? We're going to try to go in the same way and get back to the gold room. So the divers go in and they find the door successfully and they're able to actually access into the ship. Now, where before, the, let's say the clearance was this high, everything had been crushed down to about this high. So they had to clear everything out and widen the passage. So to do this, uh, the divers started to use explosives inside the collapsing wreck. So explosive after explosive happened. They would remove the debris and they would shore up the, the tunnel as they worked their way deeper and deeper and deeper still into the Laurentic until after about two to three weeks of this, and now we're in, um, we're in, what would it be? It would be late April, early May, 1917. The divers finally get down to where the gold room is, and Demant's waiting over by the phone for the report from the diver. So diver goes down there, and he's gonna make his report on the telephone. One of the interesting things, by the way, that I learned when I studied uh, these deep sea divers, is that their vocal cords would be affected by the compressed air that they breathed in. So they kind of had that squeaky helium inhaling voice, like uh, I don't know, sort of like a Mickey Mouse type of thing, which I'm not going to try to duplicate that. So I can't do a British accent with a, with a Mickey Mouse like type of helium thing going on. But so I'll just make it as dramatic as I can, right? So demands waiting by the phone uh, for the report. And the diver gets into the gold room, and he, re and, he, and he reports in, the gold's not here, sir. It's gone. The deck is full of holes. So the storm had torn apart the floor of where the gold room was, and the gold tumbled down deeper into the rack. So the gold now is somewhere down in here. Not sure exactly where, but demand kind of freaks out, or he freaks out as much as an English aristocrat is going to freak out. And he has to go to now what it amounts to his plan C. So he figures that the, he can't work inside the wreck anymore. It's going to collapse further and further still. So he thinks that the best way to do it is to excavate vertically on the wreck, because this way the divers aren't going to be inside. So you're going to excavate vertically by using explosives to blow open the wreck and remove the pieces, the, remove the different members one after another. And this is what they start to do. Here are some examples of some of the deck plates that were removed from the Laurentic. Now this in of itself was highly dangerous work for, for very specific reasons. Aside from the minefields, aside from the U-boat threat and all of that, they, they, for expediency's sake, Demant found that it was easier to remove these, this plating by hoisting open the plates, like think about like a clamp, 
And then they would, the divers would crawl under the deck plate while it was being hauled open. And then they would stick explosives at the joint. And then they would back out, go to the surface, and they'd make the, and they would explode it. So I'm going to tell you one vignette that occurred during this stage of the work. There was a diver called Blackford. He had gone down and he was working at this particular operation where they're removing deck plate after deck plate after deck plate, tons of the stuff. So they hooked up a line to um, a deck plate, they winched it open, and Blackford goes under and he crawls under the deck plate to attach his explosives. And meanwhile, on the deck, everybody's kind of hanging out because they've been doing this now for a while, so it's like almost getting routine when all of a sudden, the line holding the deck plate snaps, right? So we can only imagine that this line holding up this deck plate suddenly goes on top of the diver. So everybody on the deck is quiet. They had had no deaths yet. And as they're sitting there, kind of figuring out what's going on, a voice on the telephone suddenly cracks through saying, give me more air. So this is Blackford. He was requesting more air. Demant didn't know why he was requesting more air, but Demant decided, to, okay, let's give him more air. So they turned up the pumps. So they're pumping more and more air down. And then Black, Blackford's voice comes through and says again, yes, that's right, and give me more still and get a rescue diver down here quick. So they start, they had a diver who was halfway dressed, so as they're dressing them, dressing him to go back down to the bottom, um, they keep on pumping this air into the suit, and then Demant suddenly realizes, if we pump too much air into that suit, what might happen? You could, have, you could blow up. So Demant needs to get some further information as to what's going on. Perhaps his suit was cut, and he's losing air, and they need more, but he needs more information. So Demant, instead of, at this point, says, well, I'm not going to give him more air, so let's find out what's going on. So they try to communicate with Blackford. Now, when these divers are working on the telephone, it's not, uh, you can't hear them very well if the air is going on because it sounds like this. <laughs> right, so you have, that, you have that background noise. So Demant says, okay, turn off his air. So they turn off Demant, they turn off, uh, they turn off Blackford's air, and... Blackford just says very slowly, very deliberately, give me more air. So, but the man wouldn't give him more air. <laughs> just kept on putting it in the air. They didn't want to rupture the suit. So the, the rescue diver goes down. He hooks up a sling to the collapsed deck plate, and they get him out, and they get Blackford up to the surface, and Blackford's basically unruffled. So the man says to him, why were you asking for more air? And Blackford explained, well, when the deck plate came crashing down on my back, the pressure was such that I felt that if more air was delivered into the suit, it would relieve the pressure that was on my back. So the man says, ah, okay, but uh, if uh, I had kept on giving you more air, it would have broken open your suit and you would have drowned in your helmet. And Blackford said, well, uh, oh, I didn't realize that. <laughs> so they keep on working at this operation until you get to June 1917, when Miller going down to the bottom, suddenly starts seeing red bricks all over the place. He starts seeing these red bricks. That was a trick of the water. It was the diffraction of the light. Uh, those bricks were actually bars of gold that they discovered and they got in touch with again. This here, I should explain what that is. Um, that is a, just a mock-up of the uh, salvage ship that they would send over to the Admiralty of the work that they were doing on the bottom just to kind of explain to the Admiralty what they were doing. But like I said, they got back in touch with the gold again. So here you can see actually what the size of some of these bars of gold was. Each one of these was, uh, weighed about 30 pounds. Gold's quite dense. It's denser than lead. Very, very heavy weight. So the gold was no longer in the boxes. The boxes had broken open and the gold is scattered and they're pulling them up now in ones. One's, one at a time. Every time that the diver would pull up and uh, pull, pull up a gold bar, they would just say into their telephone, that's one in the bucket, one in the bucket. And they would keep on hauling up this gold. So that by the time you get to uh, September of 1917, and the weather, the autumn weather starts getting too rough to really maintain diving operations, uh, Demant and his team had hauled up from the bottom of the sea 
525 bars of gold. Amazing. How many bars of gold were on the wreck? Yeah, 3,211. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of work left to be done there. And demand fully, fully expected to come back the next year to complete the operation. But the Admiralty had other plans. In particular, this guy here, and this brings up a different part of my book, and this is the part where the espionage comes into play. This is uh, Rear Admiral Reginald Blinker Hall. His nickname was Blinker. He was called Blinker because he had this like twitch in his eye that caused it to flash on and off, so he was called Blinker. He was the head of the Naval Intelligence Division of the British Navy, a forerunner of, um, of MI6 and all that sort of stuff. Uh, it considered the best in the world. He was the guy who was responsible, if you're up on your World War I history, of the Zimmerman uh, telegram, making sure that got into American hands. Uh, he was a spy master. Uh, he had operatives all over the world, and one of the things that he did uh, was that his operatives would collect code books and cipher keys that would get fed to his code breakers in the mysterious room 40 that was over in Whitehall. And then they would use that to decode uh, German communications, particularly concerning U-boats. Well, Blinker Hall had an operative in Berlin. Um, he was a janitor who used to like just go into the into their offices and just steal whatever he could find. Well, he disappeared. Don't know what, exactly what happened to him, and this slowed down the intelligence gathering operation by 1918. So uh, Paul needed to have a new way of getting fresh intelligence, fresh code books, fresh cipher keys, fresh minefield plans, all that good stuff that you need for for your U-boat uh, counter counter-war, anti-U-boat anti effort, right? So contemplating what to do, he knew about uh, the operation on the Laurentic. He knew about the experience DeMant had working inside of vessels. And suddenly he had a brainwave. He realized that the freshest code books and cipher keys would be on submarines, U-boats, that were outbound from Germany. And at this time, more and more German submarines were being sunk in British waters. So he thought, what if we got a diver or divers into those submarines? They could rifle through the contents, you know, as long as they were freshly sunk, pull up the latest cipher keys and code books, We'll funnel them back to the intelligence division, the code breakers, and they'll help win the war. So he called DeMant into his office, and he made him this offer to form this team of secret divers that would go around the island. And DeMant, well, DeMant thought this was the most, most exciting thing in the world. So, so he, said, he said, great, let's do it. So he set up his team of Laurentic divers, and they were temporarily called off of the gold salvage. And what, what would happen is any time that there was a reported submarine sunk, they would go around all about the British Isles to these different sites with the intention of diving into the wrecks. Half of the time, they would get the report, and they would get out there, and they would find it was nothing. Either a minesweeper um, hit some sort of obstruction. It could have been a rock, or it could have been a surface ship, or sometimes it was a submarine, but the submarine might have been sunk for months and months, and any intelligence information aboard would be uh, useless. But then the other half of the time, they did have uh, very profitable encounters on these U-boats. So I'll tell you a little bit about some of the stories, because each U-boat is a different episode. It's a different story, and they each have their own different flavors to it. And I'll tell you about the first U-boat that they found that they, were, uh, that they were able to penetrate. So they get called out, and it, they're in the English Channel, and it's one of, uh, it's, it's a UB type of boat, like one of the ones I showed you before. This is a UC type. This is just a, this is a captured mine layer. These grates over here, they covered the mine chutes where the mines were. So they get out there, and the first thing that they got to do is they got to go down and they got to confirm the wreck. So the divers go over, they drop down to the bottom. Oh, gee, okay, it's a U-boat, but we can't tell what type of, we can't tell what's on this U-boat. No, no form of identification on it or anything like that. So Miller 
wants to penetrate into the U-boat. And the way that they're going to do that is they're going to attempt to go through the conning tower hatch. So Miller comes over to the conning tower hatch. He opens, he opens it up and he tries to slip in. And the first thing he knows is he's stuck. He's stuck because his diving dress is too bulky. So, and these hatches were too small, so he's kind of stuck in position there. And his legs are dangling down into the hatch when all of a sudden they start kicking into something. And he looks down and there's a body. Okay. He pulls up the body, and it's a, it's a German officer, and they bring him up to the, and they bring, they, they tie a line onto it, and they bring the body up to the surface. And they, by identifying the, uh, his ring, there was a ring on his finger, and Miller was able, got a good look at him. Uh, they were able to get that information back to Reg, uh, Blinker Hall and identify the commander of the U-boat, uh, which gave them an idea of which U-boat it was, and Hall was very pleased about it. I said, go back and go get the cipher keys. So in this case, that commanding officer, interestingly enough, he was shot twice. He was shot once in the stomach and once in the head. And frankly, we don't know why or what exactly happened. And there's lots of these little mysteries on each one of these U-boats. So in this case, demand figured that what happened was the, the U-boat had struck a mine. It was about to go down. Um, and the commanding officer was at the conning tower hatch. One of his, uh, one of his uh, crew, who after some grudge or other, knew that they were going down and decided to like, take uh, revenge on him. So there's also, but there's all sorts of mysteries involved with each of these U-boats. So in this case, they come back and they want to penetrate into the wreck. So Demant decides to do what he does best underwater, and that's blow things up. So he goes down and he stuffs that conning tower hatch with TNT, and they boom, they blow it open, and Miller gets access down into the down into the U-boat. Now, the first thing they encounter, it's very, very grisly scenes under there, if you can imagine. Because the U-boats, you know, you would have crews of up to 30 men, and most of then they're dead. Some are enmeshed in their hammocks. Um, and lots of, lots of different sea life have, has already gotten sometimes into the wreck. So kind of grisly. These divers had to have a certain amount of ice water in their veins as they did this work. Uh, but the, on this first wreck, they were highly successful. And then Miller, with great determination, managed to pull back uh, the cipher keys and code books and get those back over to the Naval Intelligence Division. But like I said, each one of these U-boats um, had its own different types of adventures with it. But, um, when a, but the dangers involved with this type of work I should emphasize were significant because the U-boats struck mines in live minefields. So all about this wreck, there are other mines floating in the water. A diver would go down and, they, you know, imagine you're looking into Long Island Sound, you're a boat on Long Island Sound, you look into the water, you might be able to see maybe a couple of feet, but you're not going to see anything else. A diver would go down and they go down to the bottom and they land next to the wreck or on the wreck and then they would look up and they would see dangling all over them these mines. So if one of their leaded boots clicked onto one of the horns, boom. In the meanwhile, minesweepers were active while they were doing this work. Now the, the thing with that is that a mine could go off four or five miles away. And because of the, uh, the power of sound underwater is so much greater than it is in the air, um, the, it would give the divers concussions and, and the like. It really rattled them up. Other problems that they had was when they landed on wrecks like this one here, which was a mine layer. So what's demand doing to get into these boats? He's blowing them up. What's in these mine layers? Mines. So he's blowing up wrecks, uh, these U-boat wrecks that have live mines in it, having these secondary explosions where you have all sorts of uh, little interesting adventures, shall we say. So they're doing all this type of work uh, right up until Armistice Day, until November 11th, um, 1918. And they're actually up in Scapa Flow working on a wreck when the peace breaks out. So Demant, he was recognized, he was given an order of the British Empire for his work. 
after the war. And this, this work on the U-boats was really uh, what he was most proud of, according to his daughter, who uh, I communicated with uh, uh, about this. But um, the Admiralty goes up to him after the war and says, well, very good, very good demand, very good. Now go ahead and go get yourself demobilized. Well, the man said, no. And he said, I have another string in my bow. And that string is the Laurentix gold. So after the war, DeMent, through a little bit of politicking, manages to stay in the service, and he manages to get himself reassigned to the gold salvage of the Laurentic. Because by this point, it's now become personal. You know, I kind of view this gold as becoming like his white whale sort of thing. So he, so he, go, so he returns uh, to Loch Swilly in 1919 on HMS Racer. And they go back in what becomes like a, what becomes a multi-year struggle of man versus nature versus this wreck as they work to uncover the gold. Now, the where before your problem had to do with the war, by this point the area is uh, possibly even more dangerous because of destabilization in Ireland. Right after the First World War, there was the Irish War of Independence followed by the Irish Civil War. And there were, there were a few episodes in which their salvage ship was surrounded by pirates, uh, Irish pirates and the like. They had, they had a few close encounters. But uh, more importantly, like the, the divers and some of, their, uh, some, of the, some of the various misadventures that they went through were just incredible, from blow-ups to squeezes. All, all sorts of things happen to them. But by the end, by the time demand is done, they are highly, highly successful at this work. And they manage to recover, um, recover a significant part of the treasure. But more importantly, over the course of this entire Laurentic salvage, over the course of all the work on the U-boats, there was no deaths, no serious injuries, and just cases of the bends, which demand duly uh, recorded for articles in scientific journals. Um, now, needless to say, a, an incredible achievement in the feat of diving history. And I was always, I was always very curious, you know, when I was reading about this, uh, when I was doing, I was doing research on my prior book, 17 Fathoms Deep, I was doing a lot of work on researching the history of traditional diving and the like, and the Laurentic salvage just kept on coming up and up and up. There's been like a couple chapters written here or there, but nothing full scale. And I asked my literary agent about it, as I was pitching him ideas, and he said uh, that this sounded really interesting and that you should check it out. And lo and behold, in the Admiralty uh, records over in London, there were over 4,000 pages worth of documents, and that led me to more documents still. So I was able to, and the best thing of all was uh, I was able to get a hold of the unpublished memoirs of um, uh, Gibbon Demand, which uh, really humanized the story a lot. So uh, needless, to, I was there, this, was a, this book was a lot of fun to write, and let me just end it before I go to Q&A by just telling you guys that there is still gold out there in Loch Swilly, and that if uh, one of you, or maybe a couple of you, feel like mounting an, uh, an expedition, uh, I know who the wreck owners are, and they would be happy to have us. And I think uh, I would. My fees are very reasonable as a historic consultant, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions about the Laurentic and its lost gold. Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, the wreck the wreck was 120 feet deep. No, not too deep. And even for that time, it was considered deep diving, but it wasn't, uh, you know, Titanic level of depth. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Twelve feet, generally speaking. Now, when you're doing that work underwater, and they're doing the explosions, so they would set off an explosion, and this, of course, this would set off silt and all sorts of things everywhere. So you'd have to wait for a while for it to clear. So, but generally, uh, demand said it was about 12 feet in depth. And that's what current divers who go down to the wreck say it is today. Mm -hmm. Were the medical doctors that kind of kept track of what was happening in the body as a result of you know, this extensive diving? 
Yeah, actually, Demant was. He, he was uh, he was an amateur physiologist who actually uh, he had dreams of scientific and zoological fame. So him with Haldane had done uh, serious studies on decompression sickness, and one of his papers was actually about uh, the decompression aboard the Laurentic. Yeah, demand, demand always fascinates me because on the one hand he's doing all this action adventure stuff, and on the other hand he is he is a hardcore type of scientist who really gets himself distracted a, a lot by these various projects he was on, uh, and they sometimes seem extremely esoteric. His first demand's first major paper was called the normal temperature of a goat, and that was uh, that was because of goats that they used in decompression testing. So they had all these goats. They had this herd of goats around, and uh, one of them got sick. So Demant was didn't took its temperature, and he had this temperature, and he was like, I don't know what the well, what's the temperature supposed to be at. So he started taking the temperature of all the goats, and that was his first uh, con contribution to the uh, to the physiological record. Yes. Yeah, the ship's bell actually is on auction, will be on auction next uh, month in, uh, in England. So if you feel like, uh, yeah, if you feel like uh, auctioning it, I think they're, valid, they're asking for about 10,000 pounds for it or so. Was it a Harlan or Wolf ship? No, this was a White Star. This was a White Star. Yeah. But where was the keel, right? Um, whew, where was that? Yeah, that's a good question. I'd ha I, d I know it, I'd have to look it up for you. I can't remember it offhand. Yes? Did I have to dive on the Laurentic for its gold? No, 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 I didn't. Actually, you know what this this is this is a real that's a really good question uh, because of the way that research has changed uh, in recent years. So when I when I first went into this topic uh, and I was seriously looking at it, the archives, the British archives, they have their full listings of the Laurentic, but you can't really tell much more than they'll say uh, a binder on the Laurentic or something like that. So I contacted the British Archives and they told me approximate page counts and I said, oh, that sounds pretty good. Uh, and, then I, and then they offered digitization services. So I said, okay, uh, let's see how much it would cost for them to digitize it for me. So they quoted, they quoted me uh, 7,000 British pounds for that. And I said, well, okay, that's the end of that. So, uh, so, uh, so then what I did was I circled back and I started trying to calculate out the, the price of the flight to go out there and everything like that. And um, I contacted the archives again. I said, look, before I come out to you guys, can you give me a better idea of what's in these, in these uh, in, in here? And they sympathized with me and they said, you know what you might want to do? You might want to hire a researcher who can come down and look at it for you. So I ended up doing that. And um, the researcher went down into the Admiralty records and she said, it gave me summaries of what was in there and I said, okay, so how much to, to do all this type of work? And it was significantly, significantly lower to do that. And she went in and she photographed each of those pages and sent me about 4,000 different JPEG fil uh, files which I then took, converted them to PDFs and then went through them page by page building out a chronology. So, though I got to miss a trip to London, that, that was my, that, that was the one thing, uh, that, that was my one regret on that, but it was actually fairly effective work, I found, that the way, but that just because, you see, I'm a, li I'm a librarian by trade, as you know, Peter, uh, so, but uh, it's just amazing how much the, the, uh, the research uh, has really opened up digitally if you can get yourself to the right source. That, that's, really the, that's really the trick. There is a, okay, so let, let's do it with the U-boat question first. The location of the U-boats. So the U-boats, um, the U-boats were located generally by minesweepers or spotters. Uh, so this would occur like uh, in the English Channel and such. So uh, the, they would go around, they would see an explosion happen. So sometimes they couldn't confirm it was a wreck or not. And then to confirm it, what they would do is they would come out with minesweepers. And they would take these grapnels and drag them along the bottom and catch onto an obstruction. 
which they suspected to be a U-boat. But the only way that they would find out is when they actually got there, they would flag off the site, buoy it, and then they would, um, they would send a diver down to do it, to take a look. As for the regular, you mean the mouthpiece that's on a regular scuba? Well, that's where a regular yeah. Yeah, all the, all the air is delivered directly from the surface and it goes through, um, what was it, a non-release um, non valve. Let me get back to the dress over here. So it's delivered, uh, it's delivered directly into the dress at this point. So there was a, a non-return valve on that so there couldn't be a backup on the pipe itself. And then on the separate connection was the lifeline. So they had on the inside connection, um, there was like, uh, like the spit cock and things like that, but they didn't really, the only way you can control it was actually on the surface of the helmet itself as for the air. So I don't know if I totally answered your question about it, but I could also break out the 1906 diving manual and we can take a look together at some point. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, whoa, okay, I'll take a couple more in the back. How about it here? With the robots and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the problem is, okay, there's now a day, there's, uh, there's 20 bars of gold out of the 3,211 left on the Laurentic, okay? And the problem is that the value of that gold is about 13 to 14 million dollars. Uh, so whatever expedition you're mounting, you have to weigh in the, the opportunity cost of mounting an expedition versus the risk that you're not going to get all the gold. Plus, you also have to deal with having to give a portion of that back to the British government at the same time. So uh, that, that, I think, more than anything else has stopped people from pursuing the gold. So unless the value of the gold increases dramatically, I don't, I don't think that there, like, there's interest in getting it, but like a there hasn't been a serious expedition for the remaining bars since the 1990s. Uh, but, yeah. um, so one thing that struck me was the amount of damage to the, to the vessel. So quickly? Yeah. So when there's a storm, typically the action is on the surface, mm -hmm. not much down below. Did that strike you as odd? So quickly. Yeah, it was. And I think part of it might have been because of the explosives that they were using inside of the wreck as well. It could have been, it could have further compromised, it further, could have further compromised it. I don't have any explanation for it except that the weather itself was a tremendously rough. Not like constant storm all the time, but increasing swells, oceanic swells coming in. So when something gave on that, you know, only after a couple of weeks, the whole thing flattened out. So when they found the wreck flattened like that, so, okay, uh, demand is approached by the Admiralty at the very end of January 1917. They get onto the wreck and start doing the work in March. So when they, the storms happen, end of March, early April, and such, and then they don't get back to that wreck until until like mid-April or so, and they find it in that condition. So I just think that the explosives that they were using also compromised the vessel a little bit. Um, but yeah, it, it is it is awfully quick. But that's what happened in this case. Judy. After the war, the um, the, you mean the mines that sunk the Laurentic? Or mi just mines in general? Oh, well, after the war, uh, the Allies each took a portion of like going around and like sweeping up the remaining mines. So they had to, yeah, after you lay all those minefields and the peace breaks out, you, you got to get rid of the mines. So yeah, they, yeah, yeah. And yes? What was the lighting source? The lighting. Oh, the for the divers? Yeah. Oh, by this point, they had underwater lamps. That, that were connected by an electrical cable to the surface. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, they, they could. Yeah, they did have. They did have effective uh, uh, light, uh, flashlights underwater. Yeah. Torches? No torches were uh, torches were developed by the Americans during the S fifty one salvage in the early nineteen twenties, and in the back. Uh, 
Well, you'll have to read the book to find <laughs> out. Um, but because it because the gold, you have 3,211 bars of gold scattered all about this wreckage that's gone into every crevice, and it has a tendency to sink further and further down. So it wasn't like it wasn't like when Miller went down that all the golds just opened there. No, he found he on that first dive. He found maybe like a, a handful of bars, like five bars, and that's what it came down to. Like on certain days, they would find nothing, and on other days, you remove a deck plate and you find three. On another day, you might find a horde of thirty-two or something like that. All right, one last question. Yes. Mm. It was uh, twelve thousand pounds built in uh, twelve thousand tons, built in uh, nineteen oh six. All right, well, thank you very much. I think I'm hanging out to sign books if, you're, if you want to go get some gold. So thank you.